This is the second video that covers chapter one of our text. This section covers deductive and inductive arguments as well as their evaluation concepts. So what you'll have at the end of this chapter is the large framework within which we are going to study specific argumentation systems and patterns. In other words, what we're going to do once we understand what an argument is and how it functions and how you identify it is to look more specifically, to sort of narrow our focus a bit, to look at what types of arguments there are. And we're going to distinguish between, like I said, inductive and deductive arguments, how to evaluate them, and then we'll go into inductive arguments and look specifically at uh, probabilistic reasoning and we'll look in terms of deductive arguments at what's known as categorical logic and propositional logic. These latter two systems of deductive reasoning are the most common in our daily lives and also are the foundation for further work in logic. Let's go ahead and look at the last three sections of chapter one. So we covered sections A through D. Now we're going to look at sections E, F, and G. So first, we're going to distinguish between deductive and inductive arguments, and then we'll look at how we evaluate deductive arguments, and lastly, how we evaluate inductive arguments. The way that I like to introduce the distinction between deductive arguments and inductive arguments is not by way of their technical names, but by way of what you already understand. So you can think of a deductive argument as an argument that does not rely on experience in order for you to derive the conclusion. I think you've all seen those Happy Cows commercials. Great milk comes from Happy Cows. Happy Cows come from California. An inductive argument relies on experience for the progression from premises to conclusion. So for example, if I walk out to my car, I put the key in the ignition, I turn the ignition and nothing happens, take the key out of the ignition, put the key back in, turn the ignition, nothing happens, I will likely infer that my battery is dead. Now, I can't get just from thinking about putting a key in the ignition and turning the ignition to the conclusion, my battery is dead, without experience. Either my own experience of previously having had uh, dead car batteries or from hearing from other people that typically when your car doesn't turn over, and in fact it doesn't even try to turn over, that the battery is dead. Now, inductive arguments or experiential arguments have a different premise to conclusion relationship than do deductive arguments. Deductive arguments are arguments in which it is claimed that the conclusion follows necessarily from the premises. In other words, if the premises are true, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. On the other hand, an inductive argument has a relationship of probability between premises and conclusion. The premises make it more or less likely, depending on how good the argument is, for the conclusion to be true. 
One of the ways that you can tell the difference between an inductive and a deductive argument is how the argument is set up. In other words, the language that's used. Of course, this is not going to guarantee that you can distinguish an inductive uh, and, it, sorry, distinguish between an inductive and a deductive argument. Um, perhaps the easiest way to distinguish between an inductive and a deductive argument is that deductive arguments are typically um, those arguments that are involved in mathematics, uh, geometry, for example, arguments by definition. On the other hand, inductive arguments tend to be arguments from analogy, probabilistic or statistical arguments, scientific arguments. Let's take a look at an example to see how your understanding of the distinction between deductive and inductive arguments is uh, going. Most college, fresh, sorry, most college freshmen have part-time jobs. Sue is a college freshman, thus Sue has a part-time job. The reason why this argument is inductive is because the conclusion is not guaranteed. In other words, just because most college freshmen have part-time jobs and Sue is a college freshman does not guarantee that she is one of those who has a, a part-time job. Take a look at how this argument can be reformulated in order to make it deductive. All college freshmen have part-time jobs. Sue is a college freshman, thus Sue has a part-time job. If the premises are true, then it falls necessarily that Sue has a part-time job. I just want to pause at this point to make a point about um, the distinction between a deductive and an inductive argument um, that's being made in this textbook. Some textbooks you'll find will distinguish a, a deductive argument from an, an inductive argument based on the type of argument you have. So for example, deductive arguments, whether they succeed or not, are classified as such because they are, let's say, mathematical or because they deal with categories of things. In other words, the argumentation classification is based on uh, features of the argument, not on whether or not the argument succeeds. You probably just noticed with the example that we looked at just a moment ago, that in our textbook, the classification at this point is based on whether or not the argument succeeds. So you have a basic distinction as follows. When the argument's premises guarantee the truth of the conclusion, the argument is considered deductive. In all other cases, it's considered inductive. Just so you know, you're largely going to be asked not to determine whether or not you have a deductive or an, or an inductive argument, but instead you'll largely be asked to determine whether or not this deductive argument you are given succeeds or not, whether this inductive argument you're given succeeds or not. Okay, so typically what we're going to do in this class is make sure that you're presented with an argument that's already classified as deductive or inductive and on that basis, you'll then go into your evaluation process. But for right now, what you're being asked to do is recognize a distinction between the non-experiential or deductive argument and experiential or inductive argument based on whether or not the premises, if accepted as true, guarantee the conclusion. All right, now let's talk a little bit more about what is meant by saying that an argument whose premises guarantees its conclusion is a deductive argument. More specifically, an argument whose premises guarantee its conclusion is classified or evaluated as a valid argument. So this is going to take a little bit of practice on your part to, um, to, to really grasp but for right now, you want to work with the definition of validity. An argument is valid when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. So, for example, I can say, hey, I have candy in my right hand or my left hand. 
since the candy is not in my right hand, it follows that it's in my left hand. If the premises are true, and the premises are, I have candy in my right hand or my left hand, candy is not in my right hand, then the conclusion has to be true. Candy's therefore in my left hand. It doesn't matter whether or not I actually have candy in my right hand or my left hand. If it's true that candy is in my right hand or my left hand and it's not in my right hand, it must be true that the candy's in my left hand, just as a matter of deduction. When, on the other hand, your premises don't guarantee the truth of the conclusion, then the argument is invalid. Let's take a look at some examples. So here we have on the left side of your screen an argument. Remember we talked a bit earlier about putting your premises one on top of the other and then your conclusion on the bottom. Here we have that arrangement and the line that you see separates the premises from the conclusion. So the premises are all beagles are dogs, all dogs are mammals, therefore all beagles are mammals. It has the following form, all B or D, all D or M, all B or M. The way that you know this argument is valid for right now is by definition of validity. In other words, if it's true that all beagles are dogs, and it's also true that all dogs are mammals, the form of the argument forces you to accept the conclusion. Remember that um, uh, happy cows argument that we were talking about earlier? So I can substitute beagles, dogs, and mammals with milk, happy cows, in California. All great milk comes from happy cows. All happy cows come from California. So all great milk comes from California. Any substitution of the argument that has the form you're seeing is going to be a valid argument. So here's another thing that you can think about when you're thinking about validity. Validity is not about the content of the argument. It's not about the actual truth or falsity of the sentences in the argument. It's about the structure or form of the argument. Okay, now let's say something more about uh, the evaluation concepts. We know what makes an argument valid. An argument is valid when it's impossible for the conclusion to be false if the premises are true. And what you do is you assume the premises are true and see if those uh, premises thereby force the conclusion to be true. Okay? But you can also think in terms of soundness. A sound argument is a valid argument and in fact the content, the premises, is good, are good. So the content is good or the premises are true. An unsound argument is one that is invalid or the argument could be valid but at least one of the premises is false. Now you're probably feeling a little bit like you're playing mental twister but remember that we're focusing on the concept of validity and then the additional concept is one of soundness. So a valid argument is structurally correct. A sound argument is not only structurally correct, the content is also true. So let's go back to uh, this example. I believe it's true that all beagles are dogs. I also believe it's true that all dogs are mammals. And so in terms of content, we have actually true premises. The argument is valid, and so we have a sound argument. A sound argument is valid and the premises are actually true. If we're just looking at the form, which you see in the blue box, there's no way to determine content. In other words, we can't tell other than the argument being valid if the argument is also sound. When we have an argument that's invalid, we have an argument whose premises do not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. 
So what you can do when you believe you have an invalid argument is you can substitute for the terms in the original argument sentences that are true for the premises but false for the conclusion. So if you look in the blue box, you'll see the following argument. All B R S, all G R S, all B R G. Just looking at the argument, just eyeballing it, you may not be able to see that the argument is invalid. But if you think it might be invalid, what you do is take true premises. So look over to your right. All men are human beings. That's true. All women are human beings. That's true. But the conclusion does not follow. It's actually false. All men are women. So an invalid argument is one in which the conclusion is not guaranteed by the premises. Just because the premises are assumed true or are in fact true does not mean that your conclusion must also be true. Let's take an example and see how you're doing. No CRB, no CRS, no BRS. The question is, does this argument's conclusion follow necessarily from the premises? In other words, if the premises are true, must it be the case that the conclusion is true? And the answer is no. Take C, B, and S and replace them with crocodiles, boas, and snakes. It's true that no crocodiles are boa constrictors. It's also true that no crocodiles are snakes, but it's false that no boa constrictors are snakes. In fact, a boa constrictor is a type of snake. So when you can substitute for the elements in an argument, true premises and a false conclusion, you know your argument is invalid. Now let's talk a bit about inductive arguments. Inductive arguments do not have the same level of guarantee or certainty that you get with deductive arguments that are valid. So what you get with an inductive argument is a matter of likelihood. How likely is it that if the premises are true, the conclusion is thereby also true? And for the most part, the amount of experience that you have will tell you what to do in terms of evaluating the argument. In other words, your argument is going to be strong if it's the case that the premises make the conclusion likely. And what I mean by saying that your experience will help you here is because inductive arguments are experiential, the more you know about the world, the more experiences you know about or have had, the better able you are to see whether or not the premises support the conclusion. But in terms of the basic definitions, we have the following. An argument is strong when the premises make it probable that the conclusion is true. Here is an example of a strong inductive argument and an example of a weak inductive argument. So you've got three premises in example A, which is the strong inductive argument. An opaque jar contains exactly 100 marbles. There are 99 blue marbles in the jar. There is one red marble in the jar. Therefore, the marble that is picked is blue. So the likelihood of picking a blue marble is pretty significant, right? On the other hand, if you infer that you're going to pick a red marble, that's very unlikely. So notice that here we're just talking about probability. What's the likelihood based on numbers that you're going to pick a blue marble? Well, it's pretty darn likely. What's the likelihood you're going to pick a red marble? Pretty unlikely. Now let's take a look at cogency. A cogent argument is a strong argument and the premises are actually true. On the other hand, an uncogent argument 
is weak, or it could be a strong argument but have at least one false premise. You're probably noticing a pattern here. Deductive arguments are valid or invalid. Deductive arguments that are valid can be sound or unsound, and all invalid arguments are unsound. With inductive arguments, you evaluate in terms of strength or weakness. Strong inductive arguments can be cogent or uncogent, and all weak inductive arguments are uncogent. Let's take a look at the example again. I don't have a jar in front of me, let alone one that's opaque and containing 100 marbles, 99 of which are blue, one of which is red. So I have no way of knowing if this argument is cogent or uncogent, right, in terms of first evaluating it as strong. It may be strong and cogent if there is, in fact, an opaque jar that contains 100 marbles, 99 of which are blue, one of which is red, right? So cogency has to do with an argument that is strong and that is that also has true premises. Let's take a look at this example. Most politicians are liars. Madison is a liar. Thus, she is a politician. We don't have a way to connect Madison with being a politician. There's a connection between politicians and lying and Madison and lying but that doesn't mean that the liar class connects Madison with politicians. On the other hand, if you say most politicians are liars, Madison is a politician, thus she is a liar, you've got a strong inductive argument because the preponderance of politicians are liars, and so it's more likely that if Madison is a politician, she is a liar. Here's a chart that should help you organize your thinking. At the top, we have the concept of an argument. We know that an argument is a set of statements, one of which is supported by the other or others. There are two types of argument, deductive and inductive. We evaluate deductive arguments in terms of validity and soundness. A deductive argument that is valid is an argument whose premises guarantee the conclusion. In other words, if the premises are true, it's impossible for the conclusion to be false. A valid argument that's sound is an argument whose premises guarantee the conclusion and whose premises are actually true. So remember, the distinction between validity and soundness is a distinction between structure and content. Soundness is a concept that includes structure and goes beyond structure to include content. Validity has to do with nothing but the structure of the argument. On the other side, an inductive argument is strong or weak. A strong inductive argument is one whose premises make the conclusion very likely. A strong inductive argument that is cogent is an inductive argument whose premises not only, if true, make the conclusion very likely, but whose premises are in fact true. Before you move on to any other work in this course, make sure that you are clear not only on what an argument is, but also on the distinction between validity and strength. Of almost equal importance is the distinction between validity and soundness and the distinction between strength and cogency.